Hey everybody, it's Tim here. My name is Tim Klex. I'm on the planet to build a better planet and I am absolutely thrilled to bring you a little bit of rust to your weekend or to your week. Uh, sit down, relax. We're going to learn some rust and we're going to do that by uh, learning a lot about how the web actually works. So I thought it would be kind of fun if we sort of unpack or let's say unwrap web frameworks and try and have a go at like building one from scratch <laughs> like that seems like a perfectly reasonable thing to do i do not know how far we're going to get in the stream so uh we might get something that is really wonderful to use we probably won't uh but we will have learned a lot of rust we will have learned a lot about the web and you would have had a good time so if you are watching the recording, please do hit subscribe or follow and uh, there will be regular streams coming online. If you are here live, please introduce yourself in the comments. It makes a huge amount of difference to uh, the sort of vibrancy of, of the event. And uh, yeah, I am like really pumped to get started. And allow me, oh, sorry, I'm just going. So if you haven't been able to uh, like see how these work, um, so these live streams, as you post uh, comments, I can do things like uh, pull uh, comments up onto uh, little blurbs. And uh, this is absolutely fantastic. For those of you in uh, different time zones and so forth, um, feel free to... If you, it's very late where you are, feel free to close. The recording will be live um, for you to um, to watch at some other time. Okay, let's start looking at some code. And so the first thing to find is I wanted to sort of demonstrate to you what the <laughs> Conrad's text does not want to be hyper. It just wants to be plain text. This is a weird in joke from my Discord server. If you would like to join the Discord server, please find my YouTube. Uh, there is a link in there and uh, to actually join it. Um, there's about a thousand of us and uh, you're very welcome. And uh, let's make your text hyper. Okay, so one of the weirdest things I found uh, was an example of Rust and uh, from Rosetta Code. So Rosetta Code is a wonderful website that demonstrates a large number of implementations of common uh, uh, of co common uh, code. And, uh, sorry, like uh, common problems in multiple programming languages. And this was uh, the, in some sense, the simplest web server that you can write in Rust. Except for the fact that I found an old version that worked with one, like pre 1.0 Rust. So this would have been a written about 2014. And it's really interesting to see how Rust has evolved and become a little bit simpler. Um, we start with our main function and uh, we have a, this TCP listener thing. We bind to an address uh, 000, which is uh, code for all addresses, and then a port. Uh, 8080. Our, our server listens for connections, and then for every connection uh, that the server, our TCP listener receives, uh, we spawn a thread, and that thread uh, has one job that is to handle a client. What does handle client do? Well, further up here on line 28, we first uh, we read from this TCP stream, and then we write to the TCP stream. And then notice there's essentially no business logic in here. There's no ability for us to customize which resource we're trying to access and so forth. And that's our job now as people who are learning Rust. Um, but the read is slightly manual. It's slightly clunky. First, we start off by initializing a buffer of four kilobytes. So four, uh, oh, nine, six, um, it might actually look like this in uh, hex uh, is a four kilobyte stream, uh, or oh, sorry, a four kilobyte space for data. We call read 
and prov and ask the TCP stream to just insert bytes into the storage location that we've initialized. And later on, if everything has, has worked okay, we get to the end of the read, and this is actually the number of bytes uh, that we've read. And the and then there's a conversion step where we try to create a string from the buffer. So the buffer doesn't actually know anything about encoding. Because this is HTTP, we might be sending images over the wire, we might be sending video or like a live stream. In fact, live stream uses a slightly different protocol, but let's ignore that for now. Uh, the um, it might, we might not actually have valid text or the text might be in some other encoding like Latin one or uh, there's no requirement actually to use what Rust requires, which is UTF-8. The, uh, uh, our, uh, once we have our request, we can then print it out. So this is essentially, that's the read side and then we send a write out and this is slightly difficult to read. But this is what your server is sending back all of the time. Uh, we send back an HTTP, uh, the version number that we are supporting. In fact, I want to reduce that down to 1.0. The real difference between 1.1 and 1.0 is that 1.0 connections will close at the end of the response, whereas 1.1 added support for connections to be held open for subsequent requests, which we don't really want to support. We tell the server that we are uh, going to send back HTML. So we provide a content type and a char set, which tells the server, or sorry, the client, which encoding we are sending back. So we could, if we wanted to describe our text as ASCII, uh, because we only have ASCII bytes in our body of our text, but also we might not. You'll notice that I'm deleting the new line characters. Uh, and that's because I want to avoid sending them twice. In string literals like this, the new line characters are in inserted automatically because I've actually created new lines. On Linux, which I'm working on, uh, I don't need to um, uh, I don't actually need to specify, uh, the, the new lines are actually part of the string literal, essentially going down to the next line is the new line character. Now we can also add another one, which is content length and we are sending 37 bytes. I think that's right. Uh, so we are sending hello world, uh, inside HTML. Uh, there's another way to make this more sophisticated, but at the moment we are doing the very minimal amount of work. And on the right here, I want have a terminal. So if I uh, just check where I am, I need to, uh, so I've got my little example and I'm going to create another thing. So Rust C example.rs and then I want to execute that command, which will be example. So event our code compiles and then we listen for connections on port 8080. So now on curl, if I send back, if I ask for dash i, which is include the headers that I am sending to localhost on port 8080, I, <laughs> I immediately create an error. So that's not great. Uh, received 0.9, we're not allowed. Uh, what have I done wrong? Hmm. I need to, uh, I need to figure this out now. What have I done wrong? For some reason I have, when did I send? I'm going to just add the dash V. I need to get away from this very, very quickly. Uh, so I said send 1.1. And then received H. That doesn't make any sense. So I've immediately broken something. So this was the problem with me touching my example code immediately prior to coming on stream. First new line. Aha. 
Thank you so much, Conrad. So Conrad, like, saved my day. In order for something to be valid HTTP, the very first line actually needs to be, it needs to start with the version number, HTTP 1.1, and or in our case, we wanted to downgrade to 1.0. And now our code should work. I need to recompile the code that I have. So uh, Rust C example, and then run the example. Uh, we'll improve all of this very, very soon. And then, oh, contact link, I've read some excess data. And, but the uh, hello world there is, <laughs> I may also have too many, I do actually have too many new lines before, uh, before the body, but it, should, which is actually confusing the system as well. Um, but that should still be fine. Uh, at least we get back a uh, response from the client, which you can see in the very bottom right of your screen. Hello world is actually being sent from my little baby server to um, the client, which is all very well. Now we want to add some sophistication. There are lots and lots of ways to do this. And one of the things that you may discover very soon is that although the web seems like a solved problem, people keep finding solutions for something that has been around for nearly, well, actually 30 years. Um, and let's try and find out some of the trade-offs that they are creating and also teaching, let's teach ourselves some Rust. Okay. So I want to start by creating a little web framework. Ruby on Rails is the, um, is, is, I suppose, uh, quite, a, quite a neat role. Um, so Cargo is the, uh, what was I saying? I was going to say I need a, a name for my framework. And I'm just going to call it Steam. Maybe Steam Train. Because we aren't going to create the fastest, uh, <laughs> we're not going to create the fastest framework in the world. Uh, because we're going to be introducing a large number of inefficiencies to hopefully simplify the process of learning. Now inside Visual Studio Code, when I, uh, uh, in order to get the uh, syntax highlighting and so forth working correctly, I need to add the work, the new folder that I've just created on the right into the workspace. So now I have far less of my code, uh, but I can bring this through. Where should we go? Uh, I want to start potentially by creating some sort of type which represents a server. And the server might, and also struct response. <laughs> will I implement, <laughs> will I implement MVC? <laughs> uh no <laughs> not not in the like the 45 minutes or so that i have available <laughs> we don't have enough to have something which is very very polished we are going to be able to essentially have the very basics we hopefully will be able to dispatch to different resources and uh the where can i find theory about this my, I think my, the best solution right now will be to go to, I'm just going to add a uh, comment. So my github.com slash uh, Tim Clicks tutorials. And then uh, I'll just add this to the banner as well. So I think the, the best place to go is here. If you go to the My Tutorials page, you'll be able to find the code that I will be posting very shortly. And hopefully this will also provide a little bit of um, context as well. Okay, let's get on with some code. So in essence, HTTP is a stateless protocol that involves two things, uh, some sort of client, which is, uh, so this is, um, End user server is uh, the um, computer hosting the um, the web app 
or and we have a request. A request is sent from sent from the client, and a response is sent from the server. We're not going to be able to have enough time to really create very nice types uh, or the, a, a lot of work, but it isn't, in essence, our, uh, what we want to do is have a server which has a method um, new, which takes a uh, path. Inside it, there is a TCP stream. And in fact, let's do the listener there. And, and we'll just actually, instead of saying it's the stream, I'll say it's the connection. And I'm going to just use to string and then we return back an instance of server. The, if we go back to our example card, we are going to copy out uh, our initial code. So this is TCP listener. We're binding to the address. And in fact, we'll change this from, from path to address. And we're not going to worry about ports for now. We can just assume that people are always sending us nice ports. I'm also not going to worry about error handling. If you send in the wrong data, the, the code here will crash. And we're doing that intentionally to say that if you provide invalid data at initialization time, then you should fix your problem straight away because it's impossible for the code to kind of carry on um, with, a, with an incorrect address. There are other reasons why we, things might not be able to work. For example, if some other server is already listening on that port, then you don't really have the ability to create another connection on the same port. Um, so the syntax for creating a uh, for creating a new type is a literal form. So we use these angle braces. Uh, this is not listening. This is listener. And now my new method can be called. And I'm just going to add. Uh, let me see. And, and so this is going to be zero, zero, zero. It looked very, very familiar on port 8080. I want to re-implement the behavior that I already had in my example script in a way that is a little bit more friendly. So there isn't much difference now. We have server and then inside that I have a connection which represents the TCP connection. And then I need, let's say incoming, although this is a bit strange. Uh, So we'll stream an incoming. So this is every TCP stream. And then I am just going to do something which looks a little bit strange. You see here that our incoming message returns back a thing that uh, includes two sides. One is a, so it's a result which encapsulates a TCP stream, which is what we really care about. And an error, which might represent things going wrong. The, so how do we just, so we can do two things. Let's say we have a connection that's flaky and closes off. Uh, we want to, we can either report this back or we could just say for right now, we want to ignore that. And so I'm going to ignore that by just flattening. So this will skip any connections that have problems and only bring me back an iterator that uh, represents a valid TCP stream. and. Now our TCP stream, we need to convert into a request. And because this represents the read side.
and uh, we could say like we could also just say sort of it's from a stream the what i'm going to teach you now is a whole bunch about error handling in rust and uh, i hope it's going to be a lot of fun because so we have some new thing does the incoming block oh, okay this is a an interesting question does this block the current thread at the moment we don't uh yes it will block we haven't so the the main thread is listening for connections we have not created a worker thread that is responsible just for handling the connection portion of the tcp connection if that makes any sense but we aren't doing any communication we're not reading any bytes from the stream we're just setting up all of the sockets we haven't read from them uh, we're going to be doing that now and i just say this is a new request coming from an incoming stream and we're going to return back a request our job now is to do a lot of parsing and so to represent uh, but however unfortunately our tcp stream is quite flaky the client might just like vanish uh the com their computer might just shut down they might be on mobile and the battery ran out and so we need to be able to represent the fact that things could go wrong here and the typical way to represent errors in uh when we relate to what is known as input output or io is that we uh we return back what is known as an, an io error and in fact this is an io result that uh might return a request in fact um we can also we can just say that it does return a request so it can satisfy the type system we're not doing any work with um and uh but in fact i'm going to change this to to do the to do macro will immediately panic once it's hit <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, but it will satisfy the type the type system which is really really positive it's a quite a handy handy trick and so there's a there's a question that has popped up are you streaming to twitch as well i am streaming to twitch as well so this uh po this is actually going to linkedin to youtube to twitch and to twitter or x uh all at the same time I'm using a piece of functionality, uh, a thing called StreamYard, and um, I've got a. <laughs> I can actually share like a referral link if you want to do your own streaming. But we can talk about this, like have a meta discussion about the stream, potentially at the end once we've once we've got through the code that we want to write. Uh, again, I really am uh, ecstatic about uh, how much participation that we're getting. Let's talk about. Uh, I need a few things. One is our request needs to have a version. Uh, and for the moment, I want, and so I'll just to create another type, um, HTTP version. And it's kind of not really relevant to us right now. Um, so we say it's one point. Uh, actually, I'm actually going to skip the version, and just because this will isn't really relevant, we're not going to change any of our behavior depending off its sort of 1.0, 0.9, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, 1.8, 1.9, 1.10, 1.11, 1.12, 1.13, 1.14, 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, 1.18
in your URL that you're looking in your web browser right now, you'll see a slash after the domain name. And everything after the slash is the, in fact, including the slash is actually part of the resource. And one thing we do care about is the method. And so let's create a specific type for that. And I'll create an enum called HTTP method. And uh, we'll have get post put delete. Just to demonstrate that there are multiple things that a web server can support. Our code isn't actually going to do much of that. We're really only going to support get method to, let's say, a couple of different um, resources. Ah, there's an interesting question. Why are you using triple slashes? This is a, and like, this seems like a bunch of things. This seems like this is quite a stupid idea. Uh, doesn't make any sense. And the re there are multiple reasons why I'm using triple slashes. One is that if I go into my stream train, and execute cargo doc, slash slash open. The code that I am producing will automatically create HTTP documentation that includes the text that I've added in th with three slashes, but will exclude the comments that I've included with two slashes. So two things are happening. Three slashes indicate that I am creating documentation that will be there for the end user. Or for the, actually in this case, not the end user, the programmer who's gonna be using my framework. The primary reason though, that I am including comments when I am talking is that most people listening to this stream do not speak English as a first language. That means that having some text to anchor what they're listening to means that they are going to have they're going to be able to follow along so the the primary reason why i'm using triple slashes right now is that i am uh is that i'm trying to teach okay so we've got a request and then we have a body oh we need some hitters and our headers are going to be, we could be, I'm just gonna create a type um, alias. So this is another functionality for, uh, let me show you something that looks quite ugly and we'll show you why uh, I want to uh, use a, a type alias for it. So the way to represent headers is another decision that you as a as a, someone who is interested in algorithms or data structures is going to really uh, worry a lot about. The specification allows for lots of variability. Or the, the, the problem is that people that write HTTP often do it badly. And uh, we also want to have something that is high performance the we are mapping between a name like content type so let's give me an, i'll show you an example of a uh, so this here is a header the first line is something that we are uh, we've seen as, as special and then after the first line are these header rows and the, we've got content type where i describe the content that i'm responding to and uh, responding with and it contains some, uh, what we call might call a key and a value. So we're representing, we're associating some string or some text with a value. Like content length here, we're saying is 37 bytes. And uh, however, it's illegal from the point of view of the specification. But it's possible that someone might actually have multiple instances of the same header. In fact, there are some cases where this might be, uh, so it doesn't quite make sense. Well, 
it makes it very difficult to decide, to decide what to do if you just map between one and one, like between two things of, uh, of and so I'm going to skip that by allowing users to specify the same header twice, and we're going to collect that all into a string. And now the body is a special, uh, we're go I'm going to use string here, but for, uh, because we want, we expect that the request is going to be a string. Uh, however, in, I should really uh, keep it as the TCP connection itself because every single string that I create, and this is for people that, every single string that I create is a new memory allocation. And you can see that I've highlighted many, many things. And this demonstrates that I'm creating several memory allocations, which strictly speaking are not necessary. Uh, so if you are creating a very high performance web server, you need to minimize the number of memory allocations as you go through. And uh, one nice thing, or at least I say it's nice, is that your request no longer cares about the TCP connection. Essentially, I don't need to know about it uh, anymore. The so let's so we start with the TCP stream, and then we get back our request. I might find ourselves actually. I I'm going to change this to uh, take a mutable reference to this stream. In fact, I might show why I'll do that later. Let's ignore. Let's just create a request. And then I'm going to show the limitations of uh, the, the, the method that I've created um, and, uh, and explain why I might need to change that later. So uh, we've got a really difficult thing on our hands. We need to create this quest object and um, from a TCP stream. TCP stream re it represents bytes that we don't actually have access to yet. They have still sitting on the other side of the network. So I want to introduce a little bit of indirection, and that is I need to do, I need to show you how to read from the the uh, we need to show you how to read from uh, from the network. And we've got we saw it before. We had this buffer thing, and I'm going to change the type of buffer. Which instead of having a fixed Instead of having a fixed array, which is what the example code had, which will, once we hit, once we fill it up, we, there's nothing more we can do. Instead, what I am going to do is uh, have a vector, which allows me to grow at the expense of some slightly increased amount of overhead uh, later on. And for reasons that, well, we can do this manually. So I could copy my example code across. Uh, but this won't be as nice as I need because I want to distinguish between individual lines. And so therefore I should create some sort of helper method for being able to read a line. And so here I go. I'm just going to copy across my cheat sheet and then I will actually I'm yeah I, I will do so I'll just make one very small change so that I don't uh, terrify you <laughs> rust can be extremely complicated while you're learning and if you are not sure what is happening I completely I have you have a lot of sympathy from me you see here, so I'm copying in a new myth, uh, the factor function saying read header line, which takes as an argument a stream, a TCP stream that has uh, mutability, which means I'm able to update the inner state of the TCP stream. It returns back an IO result that contains a string. Now, let me show you how it works. The um, squiggly lines are a little bit angry at the moment because I have actually deleted some necessary code. 
so we start by creating a buffer again and this is a four kilobyte buffer as long as my hex is um, is valid and uh, from the stream I call a I might just pull all of this out so that no one is distracted we start with stream and then we ask for its bytes method and I'm just going to add to do macro to silence a lot of the angry um, a lot of the angry red lines here okay now bytes returns oh I need to bring in a trait so one of the annoying things that you'll find is that your code might fail inexplicitly because you're, you haven't brought in traits that are dependent, that your code depends on. So if you copy example code from some other location, you need to also ensure that your imports are also copied across. Now, Bytes is in scope. Uh, and I'm just going to check, uh, there's another one as well that I need to bring in, which is I also want, so the read is a trait and write is a trait, which will be handy later when we come to write things. And uh, so I now have a bytes method on TCP stream, which will bring me back an iterator of bytes. And now I can ask the very next byte. And if this is something that I know about, like a new line character, then I am done. So, uh, except I don't just get a new line character. What I get is a uh, is an option which says that there might not be no there might not be a byte to read at all. There might be no next byte. And if that is the case, so I can match. Let's actually just do it by, uh, if there's no byte, that means essentially something really bad has gone wrong and I could return back a, an error. So I could return back, essentially we have received back uh, something which, you know, has been, um, we've, yeah, I'll show you how to do this. This looks complicated, uh, but we have an, a couple of inner types. So if we have none, we need our IO error is IO error new. And then we need to say, give it a kind, which is IO error kind of connection aborted. And we want a message saying, Client aborted early. So this is the type that we are going to send back and we need to wrap that in what's known as the er variant of result. See, um, our code here returns a result and even though it's not visible, the error side or the er side of this uh, is essentially an IO error which we're producing up here on line 52. Otherwise, we have some byte, or at least we have something, and it might be a byte. In which case, this is that happy path. This is what we really want to see. So we'll just leave that as uh, something that we really care about. Or there might have been some other problem. We might have actually received an error ourselves. So we might have received some error message. And in which case, we could actually just return back the error. And slightly awkwardly, I need to unpack it with this pattern matching or uh and then essentially repack it in another um error uh straight away but because it is already an io error i don't need to perform perform any conversion this all looks very ugly we're going to refactor it 
very, very soon. What I want to check is if, if this byte is equal to the new line character. Uh, in fact, it's the new line byte. So this is an ASCII new line. Then we have finished. Then we return back our, our uh, header line. Now we still have a problem. Our header line is some string that we need to kind of fill up with. <laughs> In fact, we need to actually do some reading. Uh, this is so we, we're not quite finished. I uh, I need to actually read from the TCP stream, convert that to a string, and return that. Uh, for reasons that will become. The other thing that might have confused people is I'm not doing this in a loop. And I want to introduce an infinite loop here where I uh, will continue to read one byte at a time from the TCP stream. And uh, otherwise, sorry, buff. Push the byte. So finally, we're getting closer. We're actually reading into the buffer, which will automatically grow as things are, um, which will automatically grow as we are, as we're going. Now, you, there are lots of, we've actually opened ourselves up to a denial of service attack here because we have not placed a limit on the number of bytes that we can read in from the from the client, but let's say we're not going to uh, worry so much about security right now. We can uh, carry on. Okay, so our buffer is being uh, is added up. We now need to convert this to a string somehow, and the way to do this is with a oh. The way to do this is here is we. Uh, the string has a static method from UTF-8, which takes our vector as input. So I don't actually need this temporary variable now. I've got my buffer, which is a vector, which is handy because that's what I need later. And uh, unfortunately though, this is not quite enough. I require, uh, this is another result. So this, conversion step may fail because I don't know what the end user and actual sorry, what the client is actually sending me. They could be trying to fuzz my server. They could be sending arbitrary bytes that uh and so I need to map the error that is generated from the string from UTF8 method into an IO result. So this is what the map error, I'm, uh, the map error method does. It takes an error from one form and converts it into another. And I need to say, hey, 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 this client, it's not a very friendly client, actually. Um, it's actually sent me some invalid data. So I need a new error value, which as its kind, sort of the internal variant is an IO error kind invalid data and i could say as a message that um not an http computer i am only using my read header line method during this re the uh during the process of creating a request object and so i know that it will only be relating to header lines and you could say non utf8 a invalid uh we yeah we'll just we'll leave the message there and now the error is almost the same except well so the header line still hasn't changed except we're passing in a new error 
I can now introduce some new syntax, the question mark, which will propagate up what I have created into the caller's scope. Here the line is almost enough. I now need to say that everything was okay and I can now read one header line. Now this is some horrifically ugly code. <laughs> I was going to say, this is some horrifically ugly code. And we've just had someone come back and say, oh, isn't it so beautiful? <laughs> so, so clearly our, aesthetic, uh, our aesthetics are different. I want to do some very quick refactoring while I, because I think, because we can actually do much better than this. This is, this is, I, I think uh, we're going to be a little bit tricky. Allow me to refactor the code. And I, in some sense, you really shouldn't bother with refactoring with example code like this. Uh, however, we're trying to show off some of Rust. And so allow me to make it even nicer. So I can actually introduce some new syntax, which is while let. And so while will loop as long as a condition evaluates to true and let introduces a pattern. And what we care about is some pattern, some okay, whereby we uh, will go and read our bytes. Um, uh one at a, <laughs> we're reading one at a time and uh if we get to the end something interesting has happened it means that we never detected a new line character and so therefore we've actually detected the error state so this portion of code right down the bottom is actually indicative of a problem because in here in our while loop is when we get to return early so we do all of this stuff whereby we create our new line and then we return it. Uh, ignore the formatting for now. I can fix that. The other thing that I just want to change while I'm here, while I remember, is that buffer will also include a carriage return character uh, as well, just as part of the specification that, and I could just check if buffer uh, ends with a specific byte, which is the carriage return, then I can get rid of it uh, because it's not necessary. Um, yeah, you can do whatever you want. And, but we're, we're returning early. So if we get to the end of the while loop, it means we've actually encountered a problem. We're still doing our nice thing of being able to return back from our invalid data. So we haven't actually lost our code. Uh, we have lost this case is that if there was an error, uh, so arguably the loop is actually better, but I wanted to show that there's something else we can do. Oh, unexpected. I expected a slice and found a character oh okay so this type so here is something else we've found discovering about rust mismatch types and it's saying here i expected a an ampersand brackets u8 what <laughs> found a char uh, what is this <laughs> allow me to fix it and then i'll explain what the problem is And this may not be obvious what I am doing, but I'll start with changing the quotes. Single quotes mean that you are telling Rust about a single character. 
So this is the cha or ka type, depending on how you pronounce it. But the square braces indicate some slice of bytes, so at least zero or more bytes. And the way to provide this to Rust is with the double quotes. Now, if you just use it naively, you are going to get a error message. In fact, with some helpful diagnostics saying that you should prefix your slice with a B, which indicates that you are just giving it raw bytes. You're not providing an encoded string. Okay. There's another thing we could have done as well. Uh, we could have actually used the literal form of, so here it's a slice of 13. If I wanted to, I could say that instead of providing the uh, instead of providing the syntactical escape form of the character return, I could provide the literal ASCII value for it. But this is significantly less readable uh, for people that don't know what is happening. So this is fine. And why is this angry at me? Oh, it's angry because I have got a semicolon right at the end, which is changing the return value of the last expression from the error that I am generating to unit, what is an, uh, the terminology used for the last, uh, sorry, for essentially nothing. The return, every expression in Rust returns a value, the return value of the semicolon is unit or is nothing. Okay, now we have read header line. I can finally go back to my request. So this is kind of this horrible code that we started with and we want to be able to read our, instead of having to deal with all of the reads ourselves, I'm just gonna comment this all out. And then the first thing that we need is the uh, HTTP metadata. And this is, we can read header line, and then we get a reference to our stream. And I'm gonna use the question mark operator, which will propagate up the error code. The HTTP metadata will look like uh, something like this. It will, and in fact, I can actually, uh, it will say get a slash and then HTTP slash and then let's say 1.1. So the very, ooh, ooh, the very first line we need to break apart into three different slices. Uh, sorry, three different parts. We have the method, the resource, and the version. So the one of the ways to do this is to uh, so HTTP metadata is just kind of split. Now split is something that might feel counterintuitive. So we want to split on white space. And we aren't worrying about all Unicode variants of write space. We actually only care about uh, single spaces as long as people are being compliant with the specification. Um, we can even simplify this down even further. Split ASCII white space does not return you back a list of things. It returns you back an iterator. And I want the method. It will be the very first instance of our iterator. It returns back an option. And, uh, and then the next one is the resource. And lastly, we have the version, which we're actually essentially going to skip because we decided not to bother with it in definition of request. Uh, for various reasons, we're not going to change any of our behavior dependent on the version. Though now, I mean, we could, we could say that, uh, but we, we, we might not. Uh, okay, so <laughs> our method. Let's talk about, so we want to be able to, we've got a problem, and that is we have this type, HTTP method, that has something that looks like the actual, uh, 
some actual like the text that we see except it's not a string it's an enum and so we need a conversion step and you can see from the type signet or the type hints that this is actually an option and so method method let's do something interesting which is unwrap say so we we expect that this is going to be the case if it's not there then there's a problem with the actual we could say we could return invalid data we could say that actually this is not a really an http um call but let's skip that for now and say and then we can match method on string literals and say that if that is this is going to look quite boring and relatively routine here you go get and we can kind of do the same for uh, post put there's no uh, one and and also lastly delete I am doing this in order because I think that that the because Rust will go from top to bottom, and I think that get is the most common, and then post, and then put, and then delete. Potentially, it's probably something like this. There are more sophisticated parsing algorithms than uh, naively doing what I'm doing here. In fact, I don't even need to uh, uh, essentially, uh, but this will be fast enough. Uh, and now I want to reassign method. Which is now an actual type. Uh, I can do better. I don't actually need the temporary variable. I say better. This is arguably not better. Just in terms of slight refactoring, uh, I can uh, get away with the temporary variable. Uh, potentially here, if I get something else, anything else at all, I might want to return back an error that is an IO error new. This becomes quite tedious at the moment and just say invalid data and say unsupported. So someone has given us something we don't actually know about, we don't understand. Uh, we could do the same thing for the versions if we wanted to, but we're not going to bother. The resource we do care about, um, I'm going to unwrap. And then I want to do something extra, which is actually convert the string slice, which is a reference to some span of valid bytes to a string. We incur about 20 nanoseconds of performance problems because we actually need to go and allocate space for a new string. Uh, this is also not super necessary because you could use intern strings. There's a whole lot of optimizations you could perform. So this is essentially the slash and this might be uh, index.html. Uh, and another way to do this would be to say that, um, uh, this here is the, uh, oh, this is probably obvious to everybody, but this is the method. And I'm going to get confused because I'm doing this. Uh, I'll do it the other way around. I'll start on the left. So this is the version. This is the resource. And over here on the left, we have the uh, the method. So now the resource we really do care about because our we're going to sort of create a function some functionality for dispatching some behavior dependent on the resource. 
So if we ask for, if our users ask for index.html, we want that to mean something. So we really need to hold on to that. So I'm going to convert it to a string. Now we've got some extra to do. So resource, da -da 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 -da. Uh, I need to actually create the request type. So we've got resource method headers we don't yet have, and we don't have a body. So let's carry on with uh, this process of parsing the request. I now need to, uh, what do I need to do? I now need to create some headers. We talked a little bit right at the beginning of this whole process of saying that there is lots of opportunity for us to uh, think about different implementations or the different ways to represent this data. And I am going to create a type alias, which is headers. And it's going to be uh in fact it's just going to be headers and this will simplify the the code a type alias does not actually define something new for the type system it's purely there syntactically there for your source code and now i have headers new oh push the wrong button there i need to make sure that this is mutable And you can see it's a hash map. And we want to be able to go through the rest of the line. So it's in some sense, it's full line in uh, read header line with the stream. Uh, if line is empty, we now break. Except. This doesn't quite work because read header line is not itself an iterator. It doesn't return back an iterator of lines over the stream. So I need to change the code slightly to uh, introduce a loop. Alternatively, I could have used my while pattern again, but be, but it will be simpler like this. So I'll plunk that in there. I've got a loop, let line. Uh, multiple cursors decided to jump out on the screen and let line uh, so this is no longer a, a loop it's an assignment or formally known as a name binding so if the line is empty we have finished the headers so one of the interesting things about http is that an http request and an http res response have a unifying, uniform format that essentially has three different sections. The very first line is the metadata about the rest of the, which is the one that we've been dealing with the most, has all of this metadata about what the request looks like. Now, after that are a series of headers, and we've decided that we're going to allow users to break the specification and provide the same header twice. Or when we detect that there are the the the, the delimiter between the headers or the, between the metadata and the body is a new line character. Hello. And the new line character, sorry, it, it, is is an empty line essentially. So once we find that empty line, everything following that is the content. Uh, oh, we now, we have a slight issue in that reading the line might actually be a problem. So I'm just going to ignore that by using the question mark operator, which will jump the error into the, the parent scope. And if line is empty, we break. If I hit save, we should, oh, uh, okay. It's, are we, you, you. I know why, the, the, so this is a little bit confused. It's saying that there is some, I'm not returning the right thing. So I'm just going to add to do right at the end. There is another problem I need parts to be mutable by, so we'll skip that. 
So now I need to cr like build up this hash map. And the easiest way to do this, although I'm, I, I still think that many of the people in this chat or this um, uh, a little group of us will actually know a better way to do this. So here is your chance to shine. <laughs> here is our line. We're going to split it and we're going to look for a colon and a space. And that is going to be the difference between the, the left-hand side, which represents the, uh, the key and the value, or at least the header name and the header value. The, I'm going to do something which I don't like, but okay. So let's say we have the header name. So this might be something like uh, uh, content type. The capitalization has changed in recent versions of HTTP uh, in HTTP2 and O and beyond. Uh, it's all lowercase, which I sort of weirdly disagree with, but okay. So this will be content type. and we take parts and we call next and then we unwrap it, expecting there to be an actual header there. We've found, we've, we already know that the semi, that the colon and the space exist. So therefore we expect that there must be something on one side of the lines. Actually, that's not quite valid, but let's say we, 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 we call unwrap <laughs> and then I uh, promote my string slice to a string. And then on the other side, I am going to say value. And this might be uh, text HTML. Okay. I'm going to introduce some syntax here, which is going to look odd. And I apologize for that. But I want to do... One thing we want to avoid is looking at our hash map and checking, does this thing exist? And if it does, then insert a blank value. And if it doesn't, then add to the old value. I kind of want to do this in one go. I don't want to have to create multiple. Uh, I don't want to have to do this twice. Now, by the way, you should feel like this is not, just, just to be very, very clear, you do not need to create a string here. If you wanted to go to the the HTTP specification is fairly well defined. You could create enums, which are represented just as integers internally and are quite um, efficient. Go to the trouble of creating some sort of parsing uh, logic that looks a little bit like what we've done with the, here, with the, with the methods. Uh, entry, we want to check whether or not the thing exists. So we're going to say, does content type already exist? And if it does, I then want to, ins so if it does, I then need to like add it to the list. But if it doesn't, I need to provide some sort of default behavior. And that default behavior will be, please execute a function which I'm defining in line. The vertical bars there indicate an anonymous function, otherwise known as a lambda function. And there will be a vector and uh, has a static method. And I'm going to ask for a vector with capacity of one, which sounds like a very odd size. But by default, if you just ask for a new vector like this, Rust will not actually go and ask for any data to be allocated it will give you it will give you back something with zero allocations because it wants to save you time in our case we know that we need space for at least one value so we may as well do that up front save and essentially reserve capacity for um, the value that we're going to insert in the very next line so this Entry and then insert is actually going to ensure that there will always be something, there will always be space for our 
uh, for our value. Oh, I just pushed the wrong button again. Jumped around. Unfortunately, we get back a very odd looking type. By the way, I have not received very many questions. And I assume that, and I've been monitoring the chat window a little bit, and I'm not seeing a huge amount of people saying, whoa, 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 <laughs> please stop. Now, does this mean I'm doing fine? If it does, that's perfect. If it does not, that, uh, 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 if, 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 yeah, please allow me, please ask me to stop and explain things if you, if you need. Okay, value. What do we need? We need to insert the actual thing. Now, the type that this is. No, actually, this is the wrong, uh, long, wrong variable name. We, <laughs> we are well-behaved students. That's <laughs> thank you very much, my dear students. I appreciate this great deal. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, value is not a very good. Uh, is not a very effective. <laughs> I've used value in multiple places, so this is immediately. I need a different variable name. Uh. Here is, um, I'm going to put this as like a slot for value. So I've got some space where I could insert or push our value to. Now it has a very strange type. You see it's this ampersand mut or M-U-T, mute, vec string. It actually is a pointer into the hash map itself. And then... I can immediately call methods on a pointer to a vector as though I had the vector directly. One of the interesting, quirky things perhaps about Rust is that when you have a reference to an object or a reference, let's say a type, or reference to a type, in our case we have a reference to a vector, Rust will automatically, what is known as dereference the type. So if you were using C, you would probably need to uh, use parentheses or braces uh, to just to make it very clear what you're doing. And you'll use this star to go to the inside of a hash map and bring back the vector and then call push on the thing. We're not doing that here in Rust. We are asking the compiler to do it for us. Now, I at the end of this loop, I have all of my headers. I have my method. I have my version. and But I don't have my body. So there's a choice for you as the designer is whether or not you ask your clients, you do the read. So you need to decide whether or not you are going to just store the uh store the connection and incur the cost uh, sorry other way around uh, let me show you the type what i'm talking about we have a couple of problems one users could be uploading a, a they could be uploading an image or a pdf that makes no sense to be allowing the body requiring the body to be a string so at the very least, we actually need to provide some type, which is not guaranteed to be UTF-8, because they can be sending anything they want. That's the whole point of, uh, of this thing. The problem with asking, the problem with doing this, which is in some sense the easy way, is that uh, you now require lots of extra work to happen before the request handler can perform any business logic at all. Which is, in most cases, is going to have nearly no impact on performance. But if there was a very large upload, I now need to... And there's a question, are you going to handle HTTP methods that don't have a body? 
That's a really interesting question because, for example, we could say delete doesn't have a body. Uh, we could also have um, I. There's another one which is the head request. Oh gosh, the head request does not have a body. Uh, so this actually should be an option of a vec of U8. <laughs> and in fact, you might think that there might be a one of the questions is should you do you, if what's the difference between a an empty vector and an option of vector? Uh, the thing is, there is a very some significant semantic difference between a body of length zero and no body. It sounds absurd, but let's say that your file that you're uploading actually has no content. That's still, but we're still actually indicating to the user. Um, and then there's this question, could you do a stream like this, but building a database of vector data? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, sure, I could just implement a database. <laughs> uh -huh. Actually, I'm just going to do a very, very quick plug for my book. Um, So this is my book. Uh, inside chapter five, we actually, it's just called Data in Depth. We go and we build a database. Uh, I'm actually talking to the publisher right now to see if I can stream uh, my revisions to the book. I'm doing a second edition. And, and so I'm gonna be doing a read through of the whole thing. And anyway, yeah, 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 we can do more streams. That's absolutely fine. Please subscribe. Otherwise, <laughs> if you don't hit subscribe, you'll never find it. <laughs> um, okay, let's finally get this request passed. We're deciding that what we're going to do is read the whole thing into RAM. We do this is this causes significant risk. We could uh, expose our service to denial, denial of service attacks. There's a whole bunch of problems. And there was a question very early early on. Wasn't it? Um, uh, isn't reading one byte at a time extremely slowly, extremely slow. And in fact, so I do this thing where I stream bytes next. And in fact, it is. It's awful. It's really, really bad. The reason why it works is because I am only doing this for a very short amount of time while I'm reading the header. For the body, we can't get away with reading one byte at a time. This is going to cause a, sh a I was going to start swearing on stream. I, we, this is going to cause a lot of problems. Uh, in fact, we can do better than this as well. Uh, I'm going to introduce a new type. Uh, so we have here standard IO uh, read and write, and I want to introduce a buff read and buff reader. This provides what is known as buffered I.O., which asks the kernel to actually maintain the buffer itself, which were, uh, actually I should double check whether or not the kernel, if the kernel has the buffer or I have the buffer, it doesn't matter. We reduce the number of syscalls um, involved in reading from the, from the network socket or from the disk. The, uh, and when we're reading the body, because the body could be very, very large, The I need to actually send the stream in. And I'm a bit concerned that I'm going to cause myself a lot of grief here. Um and I'm actually probably going to have to back um backpedal from this. Uh but so I'm going to say that I now have a buff reader of TCP stream. Uh you know what I want? I'm going to, we could get around this by requiring that our argument is actually strongly typed as a buffer reader of TCP stream. It provides exactly the same methods, except for the fact that everything suddenly speeds up from our perceived, uh, our, um, so this now moves from buffer reader stream 
into the connection handling. At some point, and this is obviously, we're actually running well over time, the, uh, I could actually do this, um, flat and then map and stream and then buffer it in new stream. And this is stream. Okay, so this is that's going to be great, uh, except for the fact that I now have a I'm introducing a new problem. Um, so we now no longer need to we now need to stream read to end. This causes us a very big risk of denial of service attack. So I just want you to know if you're in the if you're in the business of creating your own web framework, do not allow your users to send in arbitrary amounts of data. They will send you gigabytes of data and this will crash your entire server. Uh, let's say though we want to have width capacity of uh, 10 megs. Uh, let's say like, let's say we have some arbitrary body and we'll start with, uh, uh, I don't know. Um, uh, think this is four is four uh, sorry one thousand in hex is four kilobytes and uh and so ten thousand in hex is uh s should be sufficient for most requests now we want to be able to say body and uh, this is a, it needs to be mutable and this is not going to be, we need to provide a mutable reference to the body. We're not passing ownership into the read to end method. This will return back a, an IO result you see here from the, the type signature. Uh, and so I want to be able to propagate that back to the caller if there's any issues. Now, dun, 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 dun. We have enough, or at least we have enough just to generate the request. Ah, okay. So, what have we got? Uh, there is this kind of issue. It's like, well, what if there is nothing? Uh, we we. So. Uh, I need to figure out. So there is a distinction between. <clears throat> if uh, the problem that I we. That I am now realizing is that. If it is a body of length zero, we need somehow to distinguish between requests that have no body and requests that have requests of length zero. Uh, I'm going to put that, I'm going to actually punt that to to do. So we're going to go semantically wrong by just saying that we can have an empty body. We're not going to distinguish between an empty body and a. Uh, uh, Resource is resource. Uh, when we have the variable names exactly the same as the field names, we have this shorthand method, method, and then here it is, it's the same. Method. Oh, I'm going to just, uh, I want them to match up. Sorry if I'm not being as uh, interactive as I should be right now. I'm just trying to think it, think and. Uh, the type, the type system is a little bit angry with me because it wants a, a result and I'm just returning the request directly. So I need to wrap this in okay. Telling me that this this request has been successful and I now have a request. Here we are, here's my request. If there is a, and so in fact, I can actually do another map. So this is gonna sound silly. Oh, uh, no, no, no. 
if I wanted to handle every, oh, okay. So, uh, it, it let request is okay. Now we can generate some sort of response. Uh, And let's just, we'll just use new as well. It's like from a request. Uh, otherwise, we're going to skip any errors. And the type system is going to um, not mind too much. Uh, so, but now, so we, we've actually only dealt with requests, but now we have the ability to dispatch on the methods, the headers, and the, the we've got the body available. We should be able to, if I just do this and I'll just print line and uh, the request, and then I'm asked for the debug output with the question mark. This will fail the type system currently because request does not implement debug. Oh, there's a whole bunch of errors up here, which is why I'm, my thing's getting a bit confused. So I can ask for, uh, the compiler to implement a few traits for me. So I'm going to ask for it to implement debug, which is going to allow me to have this kind of debug output. Uh, and then it, the debug out is going to say, oh, HTTP method doesn't implement um, debug. So there's no point in doing that. And now the type system, sorry, now the, my, if I, uh, Oops, my type hints are saying that I should really go use the shorthand notation. And down here, I have a compile error. This file contains an unclosed delimiter. Uh oh. So I've got a typo in here somewhere and I'm gonna ask Russ to help me find it. Um, I have a suspicion it will be in, oh, there it is. I expected a TCP stream, but I found a buff reader. Okay. Now, I could do one of two things. One is I could actually ask Rust to no longer care about the specific traits and instead use trait object. Uh, sorry, use uh, things I could ask. <laughs> I could use generics, um, but now uh, for the for the for the moment, I am going to ignore that. And I just want to double check that I'm actually reading this. Oh yeah, so stream bytes next. Okay. I'm getting some, um, I'm just changing the types around because the buff reader type requires a different type to the one that I have um, specified. Now here is where the, the thing get, we have actually detected, well, let's get this thing to run and uh, see if I can, okay, it builds, woo, yes. <laughs> We're only several, <laughs> I don't know people's obsession with writing everything in Rust. It's such a stupid language. I don't know people's obsession with coming into streams and then just commenting stupid comments. It's like, like, what's the point? Like, you're only going to embarrass yourself by, uh, like, literally, you're, like, <laughs> what a weird thing to say. Go find your own stream. Create your own stream with your own language. Go away. <laughs> I'm like, I honestly don't have any time for you.
Uh, cargo run. Okay, cool. Localhost, 8080. Empty reply from server. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's almost... <laughs> um, that is almost what we want. Thread main panicked at... <laughs> In fact, it's it's nowhere it's nowhere close to what we wanted. Uh, what has gone wrong here? I need to start by uh, unwrap on a none. So essentially, it we started with reading the line and we got no. Um, we we didn't get our we our metadata. So what I want to do is introduce some debugging we can do a use a real debugger but i am going to skip that for now and use the error print line which asks rust to print to standard error instead of standard out oh uh cargo run and down the bottom, I am running curl. This is going to connection failed. Oh, there's actually so I panicked, which means that the actual server crashed, and Ugh. So there's an empty line somewhere. That's interesting. Because the curl has actually sent back like exactly what is required. There's our get, there's the method that we are looking for, the resource and the version number. And that means that there must be a bug in my read header line code. It's sending me back a an empty line. I just need to change. And we don't want an empty line to start with. But why is it sending me back the new line character straight away? Oh, you know what I'm not doing? <laughs> I'm actually not adding, expanding any anything to the buffer <laughs> so of course it was going to be empty the whole time <laughs> right okay so now <laughs> now our super server might be able to serve content we'll see in fact we can't quite serve content yet we can only really get we've got headers passed uh we've got some wild bef you know we're not rails yet in fact rails didn't do this uh, rails didn't have to worry about parsing HTTP requests. Uh, I'm pretty sure that was dispatched to some other part of the Ruby. But um, this has been kind of fun, hopefully. Cargo build. The code builds. Cargo run. Ah, uh -huh. Working. Hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> there's, the, there's the method. There is a problem. <laughs> and that is, we are continuing to read. We're continuing to, so, uh, ah, this is a, so this is a, 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 down here when we get the body, we say read to end. That's actually not what we want to do, because we, there's no end. <laughs> the TCP connection will actually go and uh, continue to I think we'll just continue to wait there's nothing there for it to do so we need to figure we need to change our business logic slightly 
because if we want to be able to so read to end is not quite what we want. And I'm just going to change this to read. Now, we should, uh, see the read amount does not handled read exact or handle partial reads. And so I get this warning from Clippy and you're like, well, what on earth is Clippy? <laughs> Clippy is a linter, and Clippy is a better programmer than I am. Uh, so allow me to show you what Clippy is. Uh, Clippy, is, I'm just searching off screen. By the way, I need to actually start to get ready to wind down the stream. We are obviously not at the stage yet where we have a full implementation of a real web browser. So please subscribe so that we can actually get this done in a future stream. I try to stream around about this time because it's quite nice for uh, most of my audience to come on Sundays um, to learn a little bit of Rust. Uh, Cargo, so Clippy is a a, a linter. It ch checks your uh, style. And one of the things that it's asking is saying, if you really meant to read, then you're doing the wrong thing. And we get a an indicator if we go to the link. It's saying ah uh, that you must be try you must be doing the wrong thing. And what I'm going to do is ignore the problem with this underscore saying, actually, I'm going to tell the compiler that I'm going to care about it, at least the part. I'm going to tell the linter that I'm dealing with it, but I'm not going to deal with it. <laughs> okay. Let's see, though, if we can actually read the response without stalling. Last time, we weren't able to even get what we need. Again, hold your breath. <gasps> No, <laughs> we didn't get there. Uh, so we actually find that there's a bunch of sophistication that we need. And one of the things that uh, we... And so this is interesting. I, hold, I did the interrupt, the control C, on the side of the curl command. And you can see here that I did actually... I was actually able to get to 136 on my server where I printed out the request. And this is the material that I received. I received a resource, the method, the headers, and uh, then there was no body provided by the client. There will be more, to, there is more to do to get our code actually working. Uh, but I think this is a, it keeps, um, yeah, and, and there is actually a way. So there's, I, I keep wanting to stop. <laughs> but we'll have some really wonderful suggestions. And I, I want to show you how to add this. Um, one of the things you will know if you have done anything with um, a synchronous AO is that you do not really have the ability to interrupt a thread. Uh, however, I can adjust some so once we have server we must have a connection otherwise we would have failed that's what we defined we would have panicked and so if we go inspect and say our connection and say we can set a uh where is it we can set a timeout and I am going to just check my cheat sheet. It's the method is called set read timeout, but it will only be uh, and then I provide some duration, and then I'll say it's from seconds, and then like one second. So if you haven't sent me your your data within a second, then I will 
terminate the connection. This provides you with a little bit of uh, a little bit of assurance that your code won't um, you won't wait forever. Now that will prevent a class of attack known as slow iris, which um, quite famously was used a few decades ago in the Arab Spring to be able to uh, actually enable people on very limited devices to take down government websites. Uh, because Apache at the time, so the, the, the predominant web server uh, was very vulnerable to a particular type of attack, which which uh, allowed it to maintain connection state while uh, data was being sent in very, very slowly. Anyway, uh, I need to be able to find the method. Oh, it's actually on stream. So it's not on connection as well. So there's a couple of things. So in here, I have a stream and then I This is starting to look quite ugly. I apologize for that. So the TCP stream has the uh, this read timeout thing. And the yellow squiggles indicate that Rust thinks that or that there is a uh, something that I can do to improve it. And now, the code has changed very slightly. I'm no longer, uh, if I run and then curl, it will abort, it will say empty reply from server after one second. And I can continue to send in more requests, but this isn't actually the behavior that we want. We're not sending back a response. Oh, that was never going to happen because we never got to the point where we were sending responses. We're still having an issue with um, with the stream not being read correctly. So there's a little bit of work to do uh, to get ourselves in a production state. But I'm hopeful that the last hour and a half or so has been really informative for showing you how to work with text and Rust, how to work with data coming across the network, about error handling, if you've been able to stay with us for any amount of time, then, or with me, I suppose, then you are doing extremely well. And I encourage you, if you can, to continue your work with Rust. I am going to uh, start to wind down and say goodbye. I really love this. Uh, I really, really enjoy uh, these streams. So all of the suggestions that you are providing around different topics, I've seen um, you should implement a, like a, a, a um, web service in, in WASM, which seems like a very cool thing to do. And I also want to show off the Servo web browser. And there are lots of other little projects. Um, please do find me on YouTube. It's probably the best place. And um, again, the code will pop up in my my GitHub and uh, here is my my YouTube link. Go in there, hit subscribe. You'll be notified for new streams and videos. It um, it makes a huge boost when uh, everyone uh, has been as uh, enjoyable to. to <laughs> it makes a huge boost that everyone has been as uh, uh, interactive and um, take care. Be well. My name is Sim Clicks. I'm on the planet to build a better planet. And I will see you later. Take care, everybody. Goodbye.